This is the reading of chapter 8 of Lester Summerall's book, My Story to His Glory. Chapter 8 is entitled, Into Training with God. Listen, please subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to get to a 1,000 subscribers, and if you wouldn't mind sending an offering uh, to say thanks, I would be thankful. Chapter 8, Into Training with God. Java, one of the spice islands of Indonesia comprises of a string of high, barren volcanic cones and low, fertile plains. It was on this torrid, humid island of perpetual summer that I felt I was getting the kind of training with God as my teacher that would stand me in good stead for the rest of my life. For three years, the Apostle Paul had his course in the University of Arabia. A wilderness training, to be sure. See Galatians one, fifteen through eighteen. I felt I received mine among these islanders. Doctor S. D. Gordon has written. God is anxious that his children get a good education. Every man he has used has had a course in the University of Arabia, a wilderness training. Joseph, Moses, Elijah, John, the Herald. Paul, Bunyan, Morrison, Judson, even the divine son himself in the days of his humanity. These are a few of the distinguished graduates, but the fees are large, the course severely high, the discipline exacting, and many don't keep it up but drop out. The marked results are broad perspective, steady nerves, keen insight, keen eyesight, and insight. There come utter dependence on God, utter independence of man, childlike simplicity, warm sympathy, and deep humility. But the highest degree goes to patience, the rarest of all traits, most godlike, hardest, and longest to acquire. God has no shortcuts in his training. I would not have you think that I am comparing myself to the Apostle Paul, but I am relating the facts concerning my own personal school of training, and I believe what was God-ordained as preparatory evangelization work to equip me for the years ahead. There were 45 million people, most of whom were farm people in 1935, living in the small villages, when we reached the 666-mile equatorial island paradise lying between the Indian Ocean and the Java Sea. We were only going to be there for three months, but we had so many invitations at times that I thought we could stay there the rest of our lives. We preached our hearts out day after day, night after night, each in different places in order to cover more territory. Our ship, the SS Moriella, docked at the East Indian port of Surabaha, where we were met by Mr. and Mrs. Van Abconde, probably saying that wrong, who were to bear our hosts who were to be our hosts. Immediately, I was enchanted by the pearl divers and half-clad coolies. I quickly discerned that Java was a land of contrast. The Van Abcondes took us to their home in Timengoeng, which became a sort of base as we traveled from city to city, from village to village, crisscrossing the island. We preached, it seemed, to everything that had breath between the royal chop block at the Sultan's Palace in Jakarta to a bamboo tabernacle with an earthen floor in the mountain village of Gambang, Walla. So hungry for the truth were these people that at our first meeting in a large concrete auditorium designed to seat 1,200 people, there were over 2,000 people present with hundreds standing in the aisles and around the wall. It was thrilling to hear the Javanese choir sing the Hallelujah Chorus while we had to speak through an interpreter. Hallelujah was the one word 
of their language that we understood. When I looked out over the vast cosmopolitan audience, I saw familiar faces. There were Malaysians, Javanese, Dutch, Chinese, English faces. I was amazed at how familiar they all appeared to me. Where had I seen them before? And just as, just that quickly, I knew it was in that vision. Yes, I had seen them in the vision. Later, when the invitation was given and a great number came forward to receive salvation, as I saw all these different races kneeling at the altar, praying to one God, I saw once again that the ground was level at Calvary. All are equal. All are equally welcome at the cross. I was so young then and not familiar with all the old hymns, but years later I was to hear the words, In Christ there is no east nor west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In Christ there is no east or west, hymns of praise, hope, publications. And I recalled that meeting. Java had for centuries been a nation of Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims. There were demon worshippers among the islanders. We found over 70 regional dialects, though there was one official Indonesian language for the most part. The light, brown-skinned women with straight black hair, dressed in brilliantly colored long side-slit skirts with the small turbans on their heads. The men wore short white coats over their trousers. Both wore sandals. This picturesque garb was pleasing, but we learned that the women were held in such low esteem that if a man lost his wife, his neighbor might give him one of his at no charge. How much they needed to hear about Jesus' love for all people and to see how he treated women. Every evening on the streets, we saw the traditional Javanese shadow shows like marionettes behind a flat drape depicting events from their remote past. Much of this centered on highly unrealistic, grotesque gods and ancient tribal rituals. There were dramatic folk dances representing scenes of adventure, battle, and love. The audience was often laughing uproariously as the weaker hero prevailed over the stronger villain. In the suffocating humidity, we rode buses and trains packed to overcapacity with people who piled their suitcases, garden produce, and poultry high in the seats in the aisles. Their mouths were blood red from chewing a mixture of tobacco and a drug called minjin. From painless windows, we watched natives working in terraced rice pad paddies on the sides of volcanic mountains, a scene we were to see over and over throughout our travels in the Orient. Plowmen rode astride their water buffalo or ambled behind, guiding the primitive wooden plow. We visited cacao plantations and uh, local native markets, musical with loudly clacking abuscuses. No idea what that is. We feasted on rice, meat, hot pepper dishes, tropical fruit, and aged duck eggs, while bamboo shoot chewing monkeys peered at us from behind banana trees or played alongside the roads. It was a cultural shock, to be sure, and this country boy from the deep south did a lot of neck craning. There were times when I longed to sink my teeth into some of mother's good cooking, some country ham, grits, or hot biscuits, but on the whole, it was a pleasant experience. The main problem we encountered was what I refer to as the curse of Babel, the language barrier. This was to prove true in most of the countries I visited years ahead. It was on this island that I first confronted with I was first confronted with a demon possessed person. At one of the services a girl, eleven or twelve years old, with wild eyes approached the platform, sank to the floor, and began writhing like a snake. Her tongue would dart in and out of her mouth in quick 
little jabs. It was frightening, yet no one paid any attention to her. I got the impression that this had happened before, but it was new to me. Meanwhile, the service continued as though nothing was going on in front of the platform. When the song service was over, the prayer was prayed, the scripture was read, and the announcements were given. We were already 45 minutes into the service, and the pastors looked across at me, signaling that it was my turn to begin the message. I looked down at the girl once again and saw the stream of green foam oozing from her mouth. I sent a telegram prayer to the Lord, urging him to hurry up and do something about the girl. But nothing happened. As I approached the pulpit, I prayed silently, God saved souls here tonight. And then, in that way, I have come to recognize, as God speaking, I heard, take care of the girl first. Immediately, I responded with, oh no, God, you take care of her. I don't know what to do. Lester, you're in charge. It's your responsibility. God continued speaking to my inner man. This was a new kind of problem to me. I'd never faced a demon possession before, never had heard a sermon on the subject, and had never read a book about it. But I knew there was something in the girl that needed to come out of her. A divine urgency was building up in me, and usually when I first approach a new audience, I will give a greeting. I'm so glad to be on your beautiful island, etc., etc. But that's not what I said this time. Instead, I pointed over the pulpit at the girl still writhing on the floor and shouted in English, Get up and sit down. The startled interpreter gawked at me in surprise. That wasn't what he expected. The girl, of course, understood no English, but the demon understood. The girl took her hand and wiped the green mess off of her face, backed up to the first pew, and sat down like a zombie. She sat as motionless as a statue for 45 minutes as I preached. When I finished my sermon, instead of giving an altar call, without premeditation, I looked at the girl and commanded the demonic spirits, Now come out of her! Immediately, that transfixed look left her face. Her rigid body relaxed. She smiled, blinked her eyes, and her whole countenance changed. She became a pretty little girl before our eyes. When the audience realized that this girl had been set free, Hundreds came running down the aisles to be freed themselves by the same power of God. It brought a tremendous victory into the meeting as scores of souls received Christ as their Savior. Howard Carter was ministering in another place that night, but when we both got back to our room, I told him about what had took place. I finished by saying, I hope that never happens again. I told him I felt like a spiritual surgeon and I really didn't relish any more such encounters. He related to me some of his own encounters with possessed people, and he told me I shouldn't be surprised when we encountered demonic power. In Indonesia, there were more witch doctors than medical doctors, and curses of black magic were an everyday fact in almost every village. It was just a week later in a different town when I had another unnerving experience. Again, the mission hall was packed to capacity. Extra chairs had been brought in, and still people had to stand. The hunger in the hearts of these people was plainly evident. That night, as I entered and I began to walk down the crowded aisle, a woman grabbed my coat and wouldn't let go. I didn't know whether to try to jerk loose from the woman or try something else. I finally set my Bible case on the floor and leaned over to pry her fingers loose. She glared into my face with snake eyes. She grinned evilly and spoke to me in English. There's a black angel in you and there's a white angel in me. I placed my hands on the sides of her head and said, that's a lie. I have the spirit of Jesus Christ in me, and you have the devil in you with the blackness of hell. Then, addressing the demonic spirits in her, I spoke firmly, In the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. Her eyes changed, and her face relaxed, and she was released. I touched her gently, my hand on her shoulder, and through the interpreter asked, How long have you been like that? The woman calmly replied, Fifteen years ago, I went to a witch doctor, and the evil spirits has been in me from that day to this. 
but I know I am free of it now. And she looked up at me with a sweet smile on what had only moments before been an angry, contorted face. The glory of God spread through the audience. As I continued walking among them, I was able to minister to many others, my friend interpreting as we moved throughout the crowd. Later, in talking about this with Howard Carter, I was able to put it in a perspective with his help. Anytime someone is set free, that's good. He said, it doesn't matter how it happens, whether you are in the pulpit or walking through the crowd, the way to score a spiritual victory is to face whatever it is when it happens. Sometimes you don't even have time to think what the battle strategy should be. You just have to be prepared, prayed up, and willing to do battle. The Word of God is your sword. When those people saw that you weren't afraid of the devil, it brought faith and victory to the entire assembly. I don't think this is the end of your battles with demons, Mr. Summerall. I knew the Bible had plenty to say on the subject of doing battle with the adversary. So, Bible in hand, I retreated to search out the teachings that would better equip me for what lay ahead. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18 shows that our life is going to be a warfare. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In all my travels since, I have not seen as much demonic power as I have seen demonstrated in Java. The Javanese reverence their witch doctors. Whenever one boards a bus or a train, the passengers give him gifts, Buses stop in villages and let the witch doctors, quote, bless the people. The greatest thing I learned was that it was not me personally in conflict with demonic power, nor was it the possessed person with whom I, ba with whom I battled. It was always the devils within them. That's good. Hear this again. The greatest thing I learned was that it was not me personally in conflict with the demonic power, nor was it the possessed person with whom I battled. It was always the devils within them. I learned also that there was no reason to fear because God never loses a battle and he's never lost a battle. In other encounters, I saw possessed people tearing at themselves, hurting themselves in the process. But in most cases, the demons didn't try to harm or touch me. Howard Carter was instrumental in pointing me to those passages in the Bible that showed Jesus' casting out demons and telling the disciples that they should do likewise. See Mark sixteen fifteen to 17 I saw God sovereign in his control of the affairs of men, nations magnificent in his glory. It was awesome for this young man from a southern part of the United States. I think back to the day a Dutch banker invited Mr. Carter and I to see the live crater of Merapi, one of many active volcanoes at that time, which had erupted several years previously. We had to climb the serpentine trail on horseback, but once on top, the sulfuric earth at the crest of the mountain was alive and almost cooked our shoe leather. As we peered over the edge, the boiling lava leaped up like liquid hell and the stench of almost overpowering sulfur fumes reminded me of the visions I had seen of the world on its way to hell. I crawled on my knees to the tip 
of the grass ledge and gazed down for a time, fascinated by the movement in the black cauldron, not noticing that the ground underneath me had eaten away. And suddenly the earth dropped, and I felt myself falling toward the bubbling lava 200 feet below. The banker, with lightning speed, grabbed my shirt and with superhuman strength sent me flying backward over the top of his head. We both went sprawling on the grass 20 feet from the rim. There was now a gaping hole. What a testimony this was to the three of us, to the watch care of the Lord over those who he loves. Without exaggeration, I can say that we preached the gospel of Christ to as many as we possibly could while we were there. We preached to those in the American consul, in the Javanese magistrates, in the beautiful full gospel churches, in the hired Masonic auditoriums, in the movie houses, in the bamboo huts of the humblest peasants, in the villages hidden away in the mountainous regions. In those three months, according to Brother Carter's meticulous record keeping, we covered more than 3,000 miles and preached in about a 100 different cities, towns, and villages with strange-sounding names like Blabok and Samarang and Surakarta and Plobingo and Meglang and Kadiri and a word I'm not going to try to pronounce, just to name a few. But then it was time to move on.